Hey everybody, as I said before, we have a very special guest joining us on the show today. He is a translator for Valer Novels. He's also an assistant on Wuxia, uh, Wuxia World. Uh, it is uh, Guan Zhong. He's going to be talking today about, you know, getting into translations, uh, how they work. You know, he just recently has announced uh, Song of Exile, which the first chapter was released a little while ago, but the novel is being released consistently starting, consistently starting today. Uh, it's really awesome. You can read that on ValerNovels.com. It's an actually the first time I'm covering a uh, Wuxia novel here on the show. Usually I'm definitely just doing this Yantia, but I really want to get into that as well, so I didn't want to like leave you guys hanging. It's also the first time I'm covering something that's not on Wuxia World, which is great because I really love all these other places where you can read. Uh, but I do want to thank you so much for taking the time to uh, join us at GZ. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I just want to start off. I'm, I'm curious. You said, uh, you said that you're from Kentucky. You live in Taiwan which is mm -hmm. really cool. How did you end up in Taiwan? Like what made you switch and move over there? Well, I met my wife in uh, college in Kentucky, who's, and she's from, from Taiwan. And um, we went back there to Taiwan uh, for our wedding. And we was there and just liked it. And, uh, you know, thought it'd be good for a change of pace. And she wanted to take over her father's... Uh, factory so we decided to move here to Taiwan had you previously studied any of the language I had a couple of classes in college but it was just the very the most basic stuff just basically pinyin and just a few characters so I, I couldn't speak it or, or really read it except for recognizing a few characters Wow so how did but you... I, I had studied uh, Chinese literature a little bit and Asian history in college so I knew a little bit about the culture but so how did you get first introduced to the world of translation? Was it before or after you read Song of Exile? Uh, it was before that. I, after I came to, well, before I came to Taiwan, I was a reader on SPCNet, which is kind of where the, the Wuxia fan translation community didn't really start there, but it, it's, that's where it was the most popular in the early 2000s. <clears throat> I came there around 2008, 2009, just as a, you know, a reader. And um, when I came to Taiwan in 2010, obviously I, I wanted to learn the language because I you know, <laughs> never planned to go back, so I'm going to have to learn Chinese. So I enrolled in university classes here, and um, I was already interested in Chinese literature because of uh, classes I took in college. But the problem is, is that there's so much that's not translated into English <laughs> and probably never will be. So I thought, well... I'll just learn, I'm going to learn Chinese anyway, I'll just learn to read it myself, so I don't have to wait on translations. So that's what I started to do. I started um, uh, translating old Tang Dynasty short stories, uh, which were written in classical Chinese, which I didn't know was a thing back then. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I started uh, translating ones that already had English translations, so that I could use the existing translation as like a crib to help me understand it. And so that's that's where I got started translating. Wow. So, what what inspired was it? I, I gotta ask because uh, we're talking about Song of Exile, which of course is, mm -hmm. it's a print novel that you translated for the web novel community, which is really cool. And it's from 1965. In in the in the translator note you you created on uh, on Valera, you said you read it back in 2010. Um, how does it? you know, measure up to reading it now and doing the official translation? Like, did you look at it through rose-colored glasses in your memory and then you read it and you were like, oh, this is just as good as I thought it was? Or was it really interesting going back after you've now, like, read probably several other novels since then? Well, it, was, it wasn't quite like that. I knew of the book then. Oh, okay. And I started, and I started translating it in 2014. Uh, but... My, my Chinese back then wasn't really good enough for me to just read a book all the way through. Hmm. You know, that was the goal, but I, I wasn't there yet. And uh, when I started, I started translating Song of Exile on SBCNet in 2014, just as a fan translation. But his writing, Yun Zhongye, the author, his writing is was too difficult, <clears throat> and so I, I gave that up and you know switched to something else. And so I never really got past you know the first uh, the first little bit of the book as far as reading it. But I'd read, I kept reading, you know, other things about him, you know, 
from what his fan base in China. He had a, a like a cult following in China in the early 2000s, and they wrote a bunch of stuff online in Chinese forums. I was reading a bunch of stuff about him, and as my Chinese improved, I was read more and more of him. Uh, then last year, when we finally got in contact with uh, his family, I had to decide you know which novel I wanted to translate because he has uh, like 80 novels that yeah, he wrote. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. And, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so, which he wrote by hand, because, <clears throat> you know, no you know, no computers then. So uh, so I was just reading some of his novels to try to decide, you know, which one I wanted to do, uh, using uh, his fan base's recommendations as a starting point. And at first I wasn't going to do Song of Exile because it was a little bit denser, and I thought, at the time anyway, a little bit slower paced than some of his other novels. And so I thought, nah, I don't know, you know, if it'll be as well received. But in the end, I decided to do it because after I read more of it, because it just hooked me, uh, for one, and two, because you know I don't know how many of these I'll get a chance to do, so <laughs> might as well start with the one that I really like. So in the end, I picked the one that I like the most, and it turns out that it's not slow paced at all. It's just, <laughs> it seemed that way at first because my Chinese wasn't good, you know, years ago. Well, I feel like, and, and just to preface. Uh, Obviously, I'm not going to give any spoilers out on the show, but I'm, I'm, I'm 10 chapters in. So you gave me 20, but I read 10 because I felt like that was a good enough basis. And I feel like it, it's, it's already kind of opened up the world twice. After the first chapter, you're like, oh, whoa, okay, so this is what we're doing. And then I think after the 10th chapter, it's like, oh, sweet, here we go. Like, let's go down this rabbit hole. So I'm, I'm actually, like, really excited. This is the, this is the first uh, Wuxia novel that I've, you know started because I'm so because there, there's such a common uh, misconception that that all Xianxia is uh, Wuxia right but right, it's yeah. not true because but what is really interesting I find about this is that it, it uses a lot of the same supernatural elements but they're known as superstitions within it which is really cool so you still get those same elements of the historical and cultural uh, references but the characters within know that there's some aspect of like supernatural to it. Like you still have pills, uh, you still have yeah. like mm -hmm. referencing of like. Of course, we're using uh, the first chapter has the the black uh, dragon waters, which is really cool. Um, mm -hmm. So, what was the process to get the rights, like to reach out to this family and 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 you know explain that you wanted to translate this to, to English and what was the response? Well, it was. <clears throat> For what the the author himself passed away in 2010, so, and he wrote his novels you know years ago, and they're out of print here, and mm -hmm. the publisher doesn't exist anymore, so oh, wow. not the easiest, uh, <laughs> not the easiest to find out who to talk to, so but I figured well his family is probably the best place to start, so how to find them, and I didn't really know, but <laughs> I happened to read an obituary that a Wuxia scholar wrote on online for him. And in that uh, obituary, the author wrote, um, mentioned his daughter's name. He actually wrote her given name, which was a little surprising. And so I used that. And, and I already knew what the author's original uh, surname was. So I ended up finding uh, his daughter on Facebook. Was, I thought it was his daughter. I wasn't 100% sure, but <laughs> like 90%. So, so like, you well, Facebook it's stopped. worth a shot. Yeah. <laughs> So I messaged her and told her who I was, and I wanted to translate his stuff, all that, and I got no response. This was, this was February of last year, and just no response. So I was like, okay, well, I don't know if that was the right person or if they're not interested or what. And so I just kind of, you know, moved on, kind of assumed that was a dead end. Then uh, fast forward to I think the end of July last year. Suddenly I get a response from her, just out of the blue. It turns out she just didn't use Facebook that much, so it's the first time she had checked it in a long time. And so we exchanged other contact information and went from there. And she was very, um, you know, excited and supported about it right from the beginning. And after that, it was a matter of deciding which novel I wanted to to translate. So I read some for a while. And uh, at Valera on uh, Valera novels. Did all the you know all the legwork of getting the the contract made and uh, and signed and all that. So big thanks to her for that. Cool. How um, really quick? How are you planning to release the chapters? Well, the original novel, uh, being a print book, it has and 
it has really long chapters. This mm-hmm. is just normal for Wuxia novels. About 20,000 mm-hmm. characters per per chapter, which uh, is about six or seven times longer than a regular web novel chapter, which is about 3,000 characters or so. So it's not feasible for me to release all that at once. So I've just <laughs> broken it up myself uh, into <clears throat> into parts, which and then I've given the parts just kind of their own names just for convenience <clears throat> and just numbered them as chapters uh, that way. The original chapter titles are still there as the part uh, numbers, like part one, part two, whatever. So I did it that way just to, to make it easier on me so that way I can release something daily <clears throat> and... Uh, yeah, so that's the way I'm doing that. Wait, so you mean to tell me that when it says uh, part one, altruism and animosity on Tiger Ridge, that's mm-hmm. all, everything within that is one chapter? Yeah, that's the chapter one in the in the novel. Yeah, that's <laughs> about 50-something pages. <laughs> yeah. Holy moly. Just... <laughs> so his, his chapters are basically a story arc. Basically, each one of those parts, each one of those long chapters is a story arc. You can think of it that way. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's how it is. That's how it feels, but that's really cool. <laughs> wow. Yes, there's only 24 chapters in the whole novel, yeah, but they're long. Yeah, chapter one itself, I was like, I wanted to do a reading, but chapter one is so dense and so long itself with with the with the song and with all the names and the directions and all the setup with like where they're located, uh, what time period it is. The descriptive words in this story are very detailed, and I think that was one of the most interesting things where I read your uh, translator's note, but then I also found a forum post from 2010, I think, on the S- uh, SD- SBCC, which you were saying. Um, SBC, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, which just had this entire biography on him and everything, and he was very, oh. very diligent in the historical aspects and the, the accuracy of what he was talking about. Yeah, yeah, I wrote that post, <laughs> actually. <clears throat> oh, you wrote the entire thing then? Yeah, that's yeah. That that was my post that you read on SBC Net. Yeah, that was, that no, was yeah, me. Yeah, from you. Yeah. But I didn't know if you were translating it from somewhere or not. But yeah, that's. Oh yeah, uh, it was a paraphrase. Uh, it was a, the original biography was in something that his fan base wrote. They put together a, like a fan ebook about his work, and I, I didn't translate it word for word, but I paraphrased it. So will you be doing like a Patreon or advanced chapters kind of setup for the uh, for the novel, like where you release one folder at a time? Or I'm not planning that right now, just because I don't have the chapters to do it. I have I have some stockpile, but I need that for myself <laughs> in case something happens. So for for right now, I'm not planning that, but I'm not I'm not sure about it later. Okay, and then is it? Am I correct in like from from reading chapter one to like going into chapter two? Sorry, I guess. Part one or chap, however you've, how you just call them, yeah, just call the parts chapters. That's the easiest. Okay, way. cool. So from going from chapter one to chapter two, uh, it seems that chapter two is a lot easier to read than chapter one. Is that intentional in terms of now we're actually the children that are being told this story? Well, I think it's just a, a matter of because that first chapter has a lot to set up. Mm-hmm. And it tells you know what the the time period is and all that when the story takes place and uh, when he first when the author first introduces a new area or location they'll take time to explain about it because uh, a lot of the places in the novel are historical places they really exist and the geography is accurate and so he explains all that and so I think that's what you're what you're feeling there <clears throat> because that's the way I felt about it too anytime like a new story arc starts. And there's a new place. You get a little bit more denser descriptions at the start. Yeah, it is interesting. Where anytime, I mean, I, they they kind of gloss over it a lot in the Xianxia novels I'm reading. But in this, it's like, hey, we're introduced to a fort. It has four. It has four corners, eight guard towers. In the northeast corner is this. The southeast corner is this. The northwest corner is this. It really sets yeah. up the entire location before it even dives into any storyline. Yeah, that's just, I mean, that's his style, and also because, I mean, it's, you can think of it as an historical Wuxia novel, because it's set during the Ming Dynasty, during the Jiajing reign period. You can actually calculate the exact day that the story takes place on. <laughs> and he, his, all of his novels have a lot of historical detail in them, in the sense of, uh, like, day-to-day minutiae. Like, for example, uh, travel permits. During the Ming Dynasty, you couldn't travel from one place to another without a permit, and so you had to apply for one, and that becomes a plot point in a lot of his 
novels where his characters need to go from one place to another, but they don't have the permit, so they have to figure out a way around that. <clears throat> Things like that. Interesting. And then does the story, I'm, I'm curious, I don't know if this is a spoiler, don't answer it, but I'm curious as to whether the story stays within the old man from the beginning telling it, or do we switch back and forth between it uh, at certain points within? Um, if that's a spoiler, just tell me. I can't say it. Well, I will just say that the, 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 the first chapter makes it clear that it's a frame narrative, right? Mm -hmm. It starts off at one point. We start off with the character being dead. The main character is already dead. So we know that from the get-go. <clears throat> but we don't know how he got that way. <laughs> and so then the old man tells the story, and, you fl and we flash back <clears throat> to you know, the beginning of the, the main character's life. And so that's, that's the structure of the novel. Got Eventually, it. we will come back to where we started. Got it. So it, it's, it, it stays pretty much within him telling the story until the end, then, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah okay. pretty much. And then, do you think this is, like, one of the best kind of, Because you, you mentioned it's one of the best introductions into the uh, Usha uh, genre and the Jiang, Jiang Hu. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do, you, do you think that's, there's a reason for that? Is it because of how descriptive it, descriptive it is? Or how do you form your opinion on this being a great intro to that? It's because uh, the main character, Tsai Wen Chang himself, uh, starts out as just a regular person, a regular kid, and then a regular teenager. He's not part of the Jiang Hu yet. And so he decides to enter it because he's been bullied a lot, and he wants to protect himself. And then some other things happen which kind of force him to lead that lifestyle. And so we, the reader, learn about the Jiang Hu as he learns about it. And that's why it's a good introduction, because there's... Uh, a monologue in chapter 17 that somebody, one of the other characters tells him where he explains what the Jiang Hu is. <laughs> so, so it's pretty explicit uh, uh, what it is. You learn the, the concepts and the, the way of life there as the main character learns it. And that's why it's a pretty good introduction. It doesn't just throw you into a story where the main character is a seasoned veteran and who's, who's seen it all already. Got it. That's really cool. I'm, I'm, I'm like really excited to read it. Like I'm, I feel uh, privileged that I already have the access that you gave me because I'm like, <laughs> I need to take advantage of this and read it while I can. <laughs> but no, I, I'm really enjoying it so far. I think you've done a great job with the translation, making it appealing for anyone who, who's, who's just trying to Thank pick you. up this kind of genre. Um, what was the most difficult thing, you think, aside from just his, his style of writing that you know, was with translating the story? Definitely the um, character nicknames. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, Bald Flood Dragon, or uh, the main character is called The Fugitive, or there's uh, White Dragon Girl, for example. All the characters are known by their nicknames rather than their their real names, as that's the convention of the Jiang Hu. And the character actually specifically says that <laughs> later in the story, so you don't even have to know that. The story teaches you. But uh, the problem is that Chinese is a lot more of a concise language than English is. And so the, a lot of these nicknames are just four characters in Chinese, which is just four syllables. But when you translate into English, it becomes much longer. And so the, it's very difficult to come up with a name, a translation for the name that is both accurate and also not a complete mouthful. <laughs> because you're going to be repeating it over and over again because, the, the, because Yun Zhongye likes to refer to his characters by their nicknames rather than their real names. The advantage for the reader is that you don't have to pronounce as much Chinese. <laughs> yeah, I, I did notice that in the very first chapter when you're going between White Dragon Girl and Little Tiger and all these different things. You're like, wow, they're, mm -hmm. they're saying the names a lot. Yeah. So what's, uh, how long do you think this project will take you and what, what do you think is next after this? Well, it's, the novel's about it's a little under 500,000 characters, so it's pretty short by, you know, by web novel standards. It's about a tenth of the size of I Shall Seal the Heaven, to put that into perspective. So it should finish, I think, in November, I think I should be done with it. Um, assuming I stick to ju just daily releases, I hope I can release bonuses when I can. But <clears throat> So probably sometime around November will be when it's finished. Um, I'm not sure what will come next. Uh, I'd like to do another one of his novels at some point. But also, Etvo and I are in talks with another Wuxia author, Zhong Feng, who is the biggest name in Wuxia right now, uh, in Taiwan. Uh, she, uh, we met her, we met the author last year, 
uh, because Edvo and I are both uh, fans of her work. <clears throat> so we're in talks to translate one of her novels. Uh, we're not sure if that's going to work out or not. Uh, this is also a print novel. So we might be doing that later in the year, or and if not, um, then I'm not sure yet. Cool. Do you think there's a, do you think there's definitely a a difficulty standard that is upped when you're translating a novel as opposed to a a web novel? Or do you think no, it's kind of similar? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And especially when it comes to wuxia, which tends to not be, I mean, most of the wuxia that people know about is not web novels, but um, there is this misconception among translators that wuxia is difficult to translate, and it's really not. I don't know. <laughs> It, like I don't know, they think there's like a lot of philosophy or something in it, but no, it's mostly the, the most difficult thing about translating Wuxia is just the fight scenes, just getting, just figuring out what's going on sometimes, <laughs> because some authors are better at describing you know fights than others, <clears throat> and uh, but for me, I think the the fantasy and Xinxia novels are a lot more difficult to translate because you have a lot of terms that you have to make up names for, and a lot of concepts that are just completely made up. The worst you have in, in wuxia is just a lot of idioms, uh, but those are in the dictionary, so th those are easy to look up. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that it's difficult. I also think it's a little bit more pleasant to translate just because the, I think the writing is better. Like, <laughs> the level of writing that they had back then, even though these novels were written for entertainment as well, I just think the, the level of writing was higher back then than it is now on these web novels. Shots so fired. it makes it more fun to, to <laughs> translate. No, that's that's really cool. That's a good reason. Because there's not as much just tedious repetition, you know, but when you, especially with They're Yin not trying to hit a character count. Is that? What's that? They're not trying to hit a character count? Well, the thing is that most of them did in, in – most Wuxia authors did back then because they were publishing in newspapers. So they were mm. – it was the same thing as it is now. But I just think the level of writing was better. But in the case of uh, Yun Zhongye, he didn't do it that way. He wrote the whole novel out first. He outlined it first, researched it, wrote the whole thing, and then published it as a book. He didn't publish them in, in newspapers. So his plots tend to be tighter and more consistent than a lot of his peers. And so that helps for, for me personally. That's a, a blessing because it's not – there's not any filler. So as you are the official – translation for Song of Exile after you finished are you going to are you working with the family to be able to publish it in paperback and things like that on through Amazon and online yeah we have we when we signed the contract we got rights to the ebook and print so we we are planning to do both of those yeah wow that's that's awesome i'm yeah, it's, it's really cool to hear that like your journey's been for 10 years or more at this point I, I mean, you said 2000 when you first officially got started into it. So, you know, that's it's really cool that you went from there to from the fan to becoming associated with the language to being a translator to now translating what was kind of like a goal of sorts for you. Do you have any advice for anyone who's like me, who's totally new to the, the concept of learning the language or even, you know, some of these, these novels? Because I'm still, like, I've been reading uh, Xianxia for, and I don't even know if I'm even pronouncing it right, like, I'm still trying to work on my pronunciation for about two years now, and I still feel like I've barely scratched the surface on pronunciations or on concepts or on any of these authors. Do you have any advice? Well, the it's you know it's like learning any skill when you first learn when you first start out you're not going to be any good at it. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know that's just the way all skills are. And, yeah, Chinese was that way for me. Uh, what I did was I enrolled in university classes here in Taiwan, and that's what I would recommend to anyone who has the time and money to do it. Um, <clears throat> it can be expensive, but if you go through a, a structured course like that. By the time you graduate from it, you know you'll be able to to do basically whatever uh, with the language. Hmm. Uh, I didn't go through the whole thing though. I was a very I was a very lazy student. I did like a semester and then I would stop for a while, like a year and a half, and then I go back. And in the meantime, though, I was reading on my own, and that was really where I got the most uh, benefit was just you know reading these novels literally all day long sometimes. <laughs> Uh, just because, well, for one thing, I, I wanted to read them as novels. I was interested in reading them. That was the whole point, was to learn Chinese so I could read Chinese novels. So it, it didn't feel like work to me, uh, but it was very frustrating, and there's a lot of time, you know, months and months, where you, you, 
it takes you forever just to read one paragraph sometimes and you think that man, I'm not making any progress and your goal you know my goal was to be able to just pick up a book and read it you know <clears throat> just like I do in English and that goal seemed very far away and then one day you look back and realize oh I've been doing that for like a few months already when when did I when did I get to the point where I could read like that but it's just it's just one of those things where the the progress is very gradual and you don't notice it at the time but when you look back months later you realize oh you really improved a lot but i think in order to get there you know there's no shortcuts i would advise anyone to get a teacher or enroll in classes if you can uh, the best way uh, i think is to go to taiwan or china and enroll in university classes there you take a structured program they're usually two or three years is how long they last you know if you can wow. afford it uh, if you can afford it then i think your goal should be to find a way to save up money so you can because if or, or to find some kind of teacher that will teach you don't just do it on your own because you need somebody that uh, will point out your mistakes because you're gonna make a lot of mistakes but you won't know that they're mistakes unless someone points them out to you and especially when it comes to pronunciation and and uh, when you start putting uh, sentences together you know when you're reading it you know, you're going to come to a lot of uh, uh, sentence constructions that you're not going to understand, and it's not something you can just look up on the internet. You're going to need somebody to to give you advice and help. And for me, that was my wife and and whatever I learned in most classes. But <clears throat> you need somebody uh, to help you correct your mistakes. I mean, I will say from the the random like 4 a.m. direct message conversations with Deathblade that I have, he's blown my mind on many occasion with like, oh no, this is how this works, and I'm like what it just it every time i like research more into it and to more of the language i'm like holy mother of god this is insane but like really cool so I, yeah it's very fascinating i'm i'm genuinely curious how you kept your kentucky accent from living in taiwan for eight years though <laughs> well the I mean, there's not a whole lot of English speaking uh, in Taiwan, you know, except for me with my wife or whatever. So I guess that's why. <laughs> well, are there any are there any other things you'd like to promote other than, uh, of course, tomorrow? I guess I'm, we're taping this right now in my time, but it's technically for you May fifteenth. By the time this podcast yeah. is released, it'll be May fifteenth, and the the novel will be officially being released. Are there any things yeah. you'd like to tell your fans? Yeah, it'll be out uh, about at 7 a.m. on your time, I think. It'll be cause I'll release at 10 p.m. tonight. Uh, it'll release with the first 20, 21 chapters and then daily chapters after that. Um, I would just tell everybody to check out Valera. I think it's a site that gets overlooked a lot uh, because it's got a lot of the so-called girly novels on it. But <clears throat> there's a lot of variety here on Valera, and especially now because I think the market in general is – pretty oversaturated with a lot of novels that are just kind of the same like how many cultivation novels do you need to read <laughs> but uh valer has a lot of stuff that's a little bit different and so i would check i would check out all the novels on on valer like uh, doomed to be cannon fodder uh was a cult hit when it, was, it just finished uh, last february uh return of the swallow which at valer translates is um it's it's really a if you like the the Grandmaster Strategist, you might like Return of the Swallow, even though they're not the same kind of novel, but they both have a kind of a, a denser feel to them and a more dramatic, down-to-earth feel to them, and both uh, deal with um, court politics and family politics. So you might like that, Return of the Swallow. Also, um, uh, Unruly Phoenix Xiaoyao, which is translated by Rui, which is... Uh, uh, probably the most underrated translator in the scene right now that novel is a lot of fun it's the the main character is uh, a, a medical doctor in a in zombie infested apocalyptic <laughs> world who gets killed and transported back into ancient china as the emperor but she's still a woman a, a girl uh, but but disguised as a man and so she has to try to survive but at the same time she has superhuman strength and she can talk to animals, and it's just a, it's just a wacky novel, and, and, and it's and it's really uh, refreshing because all those times in novels or TV shows you watch and you and you you want the character to just like just hit that person already, but they don't, and you get frustrated because they don't do what you what you'd like them to do. Well, in this novel, the main character does it. Like she just 
you don't have to wait for misunderstandings to get figured out. She just is blunt and takes action. So I would recommend that novel a lot, Unruly Phoenix Xiaoyao. I might have to check that out. I have now that uh, Wudan Xiangkun and uh, and Desolate Era are over. I, my my daily updates are kind of like <laughs> scarce, especially because I read like. 30 chapters ahead on a will eternal and I'm like 25 chapters ahead on, um, martial world. As soon as, as soon as the month of may is up, all my advanced chapters are going to put me back down to like <laughs> weeks behind. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's a, that's a problem with a lot of the old guard, like the, all the old novels finishing up now. Yeah. And it's also just like, it's tough because I, I pay for the advanced chapters, but then I'm like, I just spent $45 to read ahead, but like I could have bought a whole novel at Barnes and Noble for that. What am I doing? But I'm addicted. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. tough. But uh, man, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been fun talking to you. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Oh, and, and uh, keep a, a lookout for Valer. Also, we have a new site design coming in the next few months. Oh, sweet. So gonna, yeah. I'll have yeah, to. Thanks for having. Me. I'll have to have Valer on the show too, because I am reading. Uh, I'm reading Sovereign of the Three Realms now on uh, Wuxia World. Uh, but mm -hmm. I should pick up the, the one you just told me about on Valera because I want to pick up a novel on Valera, Gravity Tales, uh, and some of the other sites because people have pointed out that I'm being a little bit too biased with reading only on Wuxia World. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, get Etvo on there or Rui or, or anybody. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Time Bun, uh, she translates Transmigrator versus Reincarnator. That one's really popular. It's got a lot of food in it. <clears throat> Well, I'm all for food. Well, fans can follow you on Twitter at uh, Guanzhong Wuxia. Uh, it's uh, G-U-A-N-Z-H-O-N-G-W-U-X-I-A. That's your Twitter. And uh, do you have any other social media you want them to check you out on? Uh, that's the one I use mostly. I have Instagram, but I don't really use it. So, yeah, Twitter will be all right. All right, cool. Thank you so much for coming on the show, and uh, we'll talk to you again sometime soon. All right, thanks for having me.